Are you ready to put your oxygen mask on? Yes. 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 So before we get going, and no pun intended, I just want to take the temperature of the room. So uh, on a scale of one to 10, if you could tell me uh, one, I need a hug. We're not going to be giving hugs, so don't worry about it. Um, five, I'm feeling OK, you know, but I could be doing better. And 10, I am a superstar today. So let's see, how many ones do we have in the room? That's a good start. How many five? OK, we'll get you to 10. How many tens do we have in the room? There we go. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> So um, before, again, um, I would like to remind you, this is your session, so we encourage you to uh, participate throughout, uh, ask questions, uh, do no way for the end. I think we found, find these sessions to be a little bit more helpful when we get participation from, from the audience, because the intention is to get you um, to ask the questions, to get you answers, so that you leave the session with a sense of uh, have le you know, having learned something. So my name is John Bayo. I'm the Deputy uh, Director uh, with the National Center for State Courts. And um, I have the honor of moderating this panel. And as you know, um, the moderator just keeps the conversation going, but the context and the substance actually lays with the uh, panel members. So um, again, we have a very um, exciting session ahead of us. And um, please be engaged. Um, as you know, as court leaders, uh, your mental health is important, and you cannot lead. Um, I'm getting a, 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 a what? Oh, OK. So we don't have to evacuate, do we? OK, good. <laughs> so let's, let's get grounded again. <laughs> So as court leaders, uh, we cannot lead a mentally healthy and diverse workforce unless you are taking care of yourself. Uh, that is something uh, to keep in mind as you lead uh, your organization. Uh, today, we're going to be weaving in uh, personal stories uh, with evidence-based practices. Um, the presenters will highlight um, effective mental health policies and practices uh, for court leaders and personnel to maximize the health the performance of our internal core community. Um, I just wanted to highlight that a, publica a publication by the National Center for State Courts in collaboration with the National Judicial Task Force for, to examine state courts' response uh, to mental health wrote that a recent Society for Human Resources Management CHIRM, um, survey found that 41% of workers feel burned out due to factors like working remotely, uh, which is really taking a toll on some folks, uh, working longer hours, jungle, juggling family demands, and um, also threaten job security. Uh, these days, people don't know, um, you know how secure uh, their job could be. Um, these factors can affect individual uh, psychological health and contr contribute to anxiety, depression, and loneliness. Conditions that can lead uh, to increase in substance abuse, stress, depression, suicidal thoughts, and trauma-related disorders. This epidemic extends to judges and court employees and may be exacerbated by the often face-to-face -face na nature of the work that we do, um, addressing the needs and concerns of judges and court employee is paramount if we want um, to gain and maintain public trust and confidence in the work that we do. Uh, so just keep that in mind. I wanted to use that example just uh, to put into context uh, what is going to be discussed uh, by this wonderful uh, panel today. And now let me introduce the panel uh, who will be doing the bulk of the work uh, today. Um, so uh, let me begin with Kristen Treble Haversmet, um, who works with the National Centers for State Courts, uh, Court Consulting Services. Um, Kristen works for um, 
is within the Core Consulting Services Division at the National Center for State War Courts, and her work is focused primarily in the uh, following areas, core governance, leadership, coaching, and development, case flow, and workload management. Kristen previously served as the Minnesota, is it Minnesota or Minnesota? Minnesota. Okay, just want to make sure. Huh? <laughs> Judicial's Branch Core Services Director. In this role, Krista, Kristen oversaw the Core uh, Services Division of the State Courts Administrator's Office. Also, I would like to introduce you to Aaron Hood. Aaron is the current and first Chief Financial Officer. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> For the Indiana Supreme Court, and recently added Chief Operating uh, Officer to the duties now overseeing fiscal operation personnel. Pr and prior to joining uh, the Corps seven years ago, Aaron served as the controller and budget director for the Indiana Department of Tran Transportation for two years, was the CFO of the Information Services Agency of the Consolidated City of Indianapolis, Marion County, and for six years has worked for some nonprofits and private sector companies during his 28-year uh, career. And last but not least, someone who, who I had a, the pleasure to work with in the Massachusetts court system is Sheila Casey. Sheila is the specialty courts administrator uh, for the Massachusetts trial court. In that role, she oversees the development, operations, training, and evaluation of the Commonwealth 63 plus specialty courts <laughs> as well as other behavioral health initiatives across the trial court. She is the chair of the trial court's trauma response task force, which was created to develop comprehensive, collaborative, and sustainable solutions that will increase the capacity of the trial, trial court to understand, recognize, and effectively respond to the impacts of trauma among the people we serve our staff and our core partners. So with that, I would like to uh, turn it over to Kristen to walk us through uh, what we're seeing nationally uh, in this area. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, John. Um, what an honor and privilege to be here with everyone today. Wellness is something that is key in my life, something that I strive for in all aspects and all dimensions, and is something that I try to strive for, um, especially in the workplace with the employees that I have the honor to work with. So I'm just thrilled to be here with everybody today. So I'm going to be talking about some of the national trends that we're seeing regarding well-being and wellness. So the first one is we're seeing a lot of courts developing a wellness committee and task force. We recently um, completed a survey with our HR directors nationally, and we had 27 responses from states that have completed and put in place a task force. So I'm curious for all of our attendees today, how many of you have a task force or a committee in your local court? Can you raise your hand? All right, so we've got quite a few, but we've got a number of states and locations that could create one as well. So I want to mention a couple states that have a committee and task force in, in case you're interested in reaching out to those states. So Utah, Minnesota, Michigan, Colorado, Florida, Virginia are some that come to mind for me. And each one of the wellness committees and task forces are different. So some of them are focused on sending out encouraging emails to their staff on a monthly basis. Um, some have different wellness activities like a walk or a run or different incentive programs. So there's a variety of different ways um, that they, they do their work. The next area I wanna talk about is increased awareness and courageous conversations. So we're really seeing a focus on wellness and well-being within the court community and people being more willing to talk about the work that they do and secondary trauma and vicarious trauma. So the National Judicial College recently released a survey of their judges and 50% of the judges surveyed responded that they believe they had been impacted by, vicar by vicarious trauma or secondary trauma which I was shocked by. I thought that was quite, um, quite high number. So I imagine that many of us here today, as well as the staff that we work with, have been impacted by, by secondary trauma. Um, I also wanna mention that 
there is a judge in Michigan who I think is a role model for exhibiting courageous conversations. Um, he's a Supreme Court um, justice who has been very transparent and open about the mental health struggles that he has encountered. Uh, he uh, talked about taking a leave of absence from his work and wanted to focus on some depression that he was struggling with. And I think it's just a wonderful example of how people are talking about wellness and well-being and the need to really focus on that within the workplace. So we're seeing a lot more people being open and willing to talk about their challenges and struggles. We're also seeing a number of lawyer assistance programs and um, they're creating tools, resources, and training. So a lot of podcasts, a lot of webinars, and tools and resources regarding wellness and well-being. We also at the National Center have been working with a number of courts on employee engagement surveys. So really getting a sense for our, our staff feeling supported and engaged within their workplace. Is there a high level or high degree of psychological safety in, within the workplace? So really focus on, focusing on trying to collect and gather the data so that court managers and leaders can make the changes and shifts that are needed within the workplace. We're in the process of creating a toolkit for employee engagement surveys. So we'll have that on our website within the next few months if you're interested in learning more. So since we're in California, I have to do a shout out to California and share this slide. So California, their um, judicial association has created a California Judicial Wellness and Res Resiliency page on their website, which I thought was quite remarkable. So they're, they're focused on ensuring that judges have the wellness resources and tools that they need to do their work. They also have the six dimensions of wellness on their page, which um, you'll see on this slide are social, emotional, physical, spiritual, occupational, and intellectual. So the idea around the six dimensions of wellness is making sure that people are focusing on all the dimensions of their being. I think when we think about wellness, oftentimes we think about exercise and nutrition, but this goes even deeper and, and talks about things like your spirituality, um, your intellectual health, and so making sure that you're able to show up as a full, whole person within your workplace. So, um, I also wanted to mention on their website, you won't see it on this slide, but they also have a link to different um, yoga videos and mindfulness meditation videos, podcasts, and other resources. So this is a great example of something that a court um, you know, has completed and done to try to support their judiciary. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, that was great. Um, so uh, based on uh, the uh, presentation on the uh, California Judicial Wellness and uh, Resilient um, Wheel, uh, Chila, can you tell us what you're personally doing? Um, because as you know, uh, what we want is for you to have takeaways of strategies that you could personally do, um, again, putting your mask, oxygen mask first um, before being able to help others. So based on this framework, Chila, can you uh, talk to us about what you're doing personally um, around the areas of um, um, hmm, social and emotional? Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see, so for me, uh, for me, um, the social piece is, uh... now I think you can hear me. Excellent, thanks. Um, for me, I, I've worked at actually feeling less guilty uh, about taking time for myself away from, you know, away from work. And I really value uh, the relationships that I have, the activities that I do, um, book group, I'm a guitarist, I have a whole music community um, that I'm involved with. And um, I, you know, I, I realize now at, at this age that I need to do those things to take care of me so that I can show up and do the difficult work that we're all doing in the court system. Uh, as far as emotional health, um, I think you know taking care of ourselves includes you know taking care of our mental health. And um, you know, I see a therapist. I think it's uh, I think it's important for us to um, acknowledge that uh, we need to take care of our mental health just as much as we need to take care of our physical health. But there's been a lot of stigma around that, and it's something that um, you know that I think that we all need to um, you know need to do a better job at that that everyone needs to take care of their mental health. 
Great, thank you. Um, Aaron, um, how about around the physical and spiritual spectrum of this framework? Sure, thanks, John. Uh, I wanted to come into the song, Let's Get Physical, but uh, that was <laughs> vetoed, apparently. Um, and as Kristen said, you know, physical is much more than just exercise. Um, and I'll start with, hi, I'm Aaron, and I am a pickleball addict. Um, <laughs> I may or may not have taken an Uber last night to play. I may or may not have on pickleball socks that you may see later. Um, but it's something that physically I enjoy. Uh, I get a lot of flack for that because usually people say that's an older person sport. Um, and so uh, I wear Skechers. I'll admit that from time to time when I play, that's okay. Um, but physical wellness, again, is just much more than physical activity. Um, my encouragement would, would be just to do something. Um, I try to take lunchtime walks or breaks at work. I, that's a simple type thing. You don't have to be an ultra marathoner to, to do something. Uh, just start small. Um, I personally block out time on my calendar uh, for lunch. I may not always eat. I know we have busy jobs and sometimes that may not always work, but I think that's important just for your physical, mental wellness. Um, certainly uh, you should hydrate. Uh, all the time, keep that water handy. Um, nutrition is very important as well. I, I'm not uh, a fanatic when it comes to eating perfectly, but I think it's very important to you know fuel yourself, your, your brain. You don't want to get hangry uh, at work, certainly. Um, and then other aspects of physical nature would be you know your work environment, your desk. Uh, I know we at Indiana we installed or offered to install standing desks for our employees or adapters that would go on their old desks. Um, doing that is certainly helpful. Uh, a lot of little stretching exercises or things you can do at your desk. I know sometimes people think that's corny, um, but it is something that you should look into just for your overall physical well-being, ergonomics, uh, how your desk, keyboard, those types of things that are set up. Um, and I would say another aspect of, of the physical uh, pillar is really sleep, uh, something many people probably struggle with, but I think that's all part of that whole physical aspect of your being. And then spiritually, uh, that means that word means a lot of things uh, to a lot of different people. I'm personally a man of faith. It, it's something that brings me comfort, but there's a lot of ways to be spiritual, uh, whether it's yoga or meditation, uh, any of those types of mindfulness exercises, whatever works for you to give you purpose, life, meaning uh, that really dictates your ethics and values. Uh, those are all very important aspects of becoming spiritual or being spiritual uh, as part of your whole being. So I encourage you to, again, do something uh, in those areas that helps kind of the whole being. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. And Kristen, how about you around occupation, occupational and intellectual um, aspect of this uh, framework? Okay, thank you, John. So I will start off by saying that when I think about these two categories, what's important to me is to be able to lean into my values in the workplace. So what that looks like for me is I need to be in a workplace where I feel seen, um, heard, and valued, and respected. And so I lean towards and strive for working in environments that support me in that way. Psychological safety is very important to me as well in creating that space for my staff to have the same um, experience. Um, it's also important to me have, to have balance, and this is where I'll be really honest and transparent with all of you. This is a struggle for me. I tend to work far too many hours, and I think John could probably <laughs> second that. Um, and so it's something that I'm constantly working towards and trying to put boundaries in place to make sure that I'm not working you know, nights and weekends and having a support system um, to check me on that and make sure that if I'm sliding towards some of those past behaviors that um, I try to get to a more balanced place. I was sharing with our panel earlier today that I, I have gone as far as having a post-it note on my computer that says say no because I'm a people pleaser. <laughs> I, I can't report whether it's really working or not, <laughs> but it's a reminder for me to make sure that I'm thinking about where I spend my time and what values I have to make sure that I'm also having time for the other aspects of my wellness and health and in time for my family. 
Um, I also want to mention in the intellectual, it's really important to me, you might not be surprised to hear this, that deep, connecting, soulful conversations are very essential to me. So making sure that I'm creating space to really get to know my team members and know my staff and my supervisors um, so that you know we're, we're connected, we know each other at a personal level and a professional level. Um, I also... Um, in my spare time, like to read, like to write. I write poetry here and there. Um, I don't usually tell people that, so I'm not going to share, but I do enjoy doing that as well. Thank you, John. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, that was great. And now uh, we would like to hear from the audience, uh, looking at this, um, spec the spectrum of the uh, judicial wellness and resiliency, can you share one thing that you are doing around any one of these uh, dimensions? Anyone, I, I, I promise I was going to get you to a 10, so I'm looking for the fives. Great, thank you. All that work just to say I, I ride bike. <laughs> hey, that, that's okay. <laughs> Anyone else since I'm here? Great. I also play pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we go. I do yoga, meditation, and mindful breathing. I think that's really helpful. That's very good. Very good. So I, I asked her if she did any of the mindful breathing during the day, and she said she did. And what I've learned in some of the training courses that I've completed um, for coaching is that it's really helpful at times just to take a pause during the day. It only takes you 30 seconds to a minute, but just doing some boxed, boxed breathing where you take a breath in for a count of four, hold it for four seconds, and then release it slowly can really calm your nervous system. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, I need two, three more. Here we go. So I spend time with my pets. So I have um, a proud snake mama. I have six snakes, oh, wow. uh, ball pythons, and Ooh. bullocks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think a lot of people are going to be trying to find you to talk more about the snakes later on. So. Anyone else? Okay, we have someone here. Well, I try to take at least one or two breaks during the day. I go for a little short walks. Sometimes if I get really stressed and I can't get out, I'll close my door and I may even cut my light out and just sit back for 10 or 15 minutes with my eyes closed and that helps calm me and center me. Wonderful. Okay, two more. Okay. I feel like this has kind of a double whammy effect, but um, I have one of those extra thick yoga pads and I close my office door and I have a curtain that is open, but that I close and that little window that sits next to your door and I close it and I lay on the floor and I listen to music and, the, and I just lay there for like 20 minutes during like my lunch break. And I know it freaks everybody out, which is part of the also the benefit because I know <laughs> they're all like all my staff are walking by going what is she doing in there what happens in there and somehow I get like this this adrenaline mm -hmm. rush from that or something <laughs> so we have snakes uh, a secret room um, so this is getting really really good uh, two more please <laughs> As adults, we obviously have children or things of that nature. Um, so we actually set aside one day out of the month, um, every month for Friends Day. And so we oh, get yeah. together and be able to kind of digress with our friends. So, yep. Okay, I think uh, we have time for one more. Okay, here we go. Uh, vacations. Take a vacation every year. Uh, I yes. had a policy early on that I took a two-week vacation with my family, and the rule was I would not call into work or answer the phone until I woke up in the morning and couldn't remember what day it was. And <laughs> usually I would start vacation on Saturday, and it was Wednesday or Thursday before I reached the point where I would call in. But you really need to get away. Great, great. 
So thank you so much uh, for participating. And um, again, we're gonna continue to engage you throughout uh, this presentation. And now uh, we're gonna be moving from uh, personal strategies to wellness, uh, to speaking about more specific about what Indiana is doing um, as a state, as a system uh, to address this system. So I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron um, to take it uh, from here. Yeah, I think so. Sorry about that. All right, pickleball socks, as <laughs> promised. Uh, so certainly, taking care of yourself first, that is the main emphasis because just like on the planes, um, if you can't take care of yourself, then you can't really help those around you that are in need. So really encourage everyone. It's, it's not a one size fits all thing. Wellness certainly isn't. So appreciate all the different ideas. Do you bring your snakes to work? Is that like, have not? Okay. Probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Uh, so a lot of times at these conferences, what I really enjoy the most is hearing from other states, other people, uh, get a lot of great ideas from things that have been successful in other places. And so that's what I wanted to turn my attention to uh, this morning. A uh, quick snapshot of Indiana, because a lot of court systems are structured differently. We're technically a non-unified state. So it's really, I'm just part of the Indiana Supreme Court, but there is a minor twist in some states that are non-unified. So we have our 240-ish employees that make up the Supreme Court, plus every trial court judge, every county judge, every county prosecutor, uh, are on our payroll the Supreme Court. I think it's a way the state did it just to set it up so that counties weren't paying more for judges in certain areas than the others or prosecutors. So all of those combined make up technically what is the Indiana Supreme Court. And then a couple just major wellness initiatives. I'm sure a lot of your states have similar programs. We have certainly the statewide employee assistance program that's run by the executive branch outside vendor uh, that technically helps with those types of, of functions. So we have a lot of employees that utilize those. Um, I, I do think, you know, some of the stigma of the past of, hey, you really need to go to see, you know, EAP, check it out, here's the number. Uh, thankfully, some of those barriers are lowering and we can talk to our employees about those types of things. And then specifically for the Supreme Court, we have JLAP. Um, you may have a slightly different acronym for what you, what you call it in your state, but Indiana Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program for us. Um, and they do much more than just serve judges and lawyers, even though that's their name, they have expanded their services to court employees. Uh, so we really appreciate all that they do for us. Uh, sometimes employees don't wanna go to them because they're a coworker, even though they're bound by confidentiality, but many of them go to them. They now come to our uh, new employee orientation. I give a quick intro of what they do, put a name with the face. Um, and so our employees know that that's a resource. They've started several uh, support groups for employees. Uh, current one that they're doing is for employees that are caring for an elderly parent. And then they're getting ready to start one on new parents. And then we at, in Indiana do have a well-being committee. Um, it's made up of about 13 members, uh, very diverse departments make up that committee, very di diverse uh, levels of employee. There's managers, supervisors, as well as frontline employees. So it's uh, a very diverse group. They meet monthly. And so I've just highlighted a few pictures and things that they do. Uh, they encourage a, a, a group walk once a month. Um, there'll be a March Madness event where they bring in a papa shot uh, during lunch hour that you can go play and win prizes. We've done cornhole at lunch. You know what cornhole is? I didn't know until I moved to Indiana. Okay. Um, uh, there's game nights. So a lot of employees are now into either board games. Um, and so some do that at, I think it's one, one day a week at lunch and then they have one evening game night uh, a month. That people stay after work and, and do gaming and order food and hang out. Uh, Puppy Love, uh, JLAP, uh, does have a couple uh, dogs that help therapy animals. And so they're getting ready for Valentine's Day to bring those animals around to all of our offices. Um, as mentioned, I'm CFO and you've never had a real budget meeting unless you've had uh, dogs come to those budget meetings. Very helpful, calms all the people that I deal with on the <laughs> budgets. Uh, there's a book club, days of service. So our state does authorize a day of community service that's work time and go out to different events. So I've got a couple pictured here where the folks went to uh, a local zoo. Um, 
and a gardening place and there's other types of things as long as it's nonprofit that you can get involved with. We just started um, Thankful Thursday, so another aspect I would say in the spiritual realm, if you will, is just gratitude. There's a lot of studies that say people that have gratitude are healthier, happier. Um, and so now we're just encouraging employees like, hey, this Thursday, reach out to an employee, a coworker, a friend, just tell them that you're grateful for them in some form or fashion. Um, we are remodeling our offices and we're adding a couple well-being rooms. A lot of times those are for new mothers, but we're expanding the purpose to really offer, as a couple of you have mentioned, you know, a place that you can go, close the door, get away from work and people interrupting you, quiet time, uh, take a personal phone call, whatever it might be. So we're looking forward to that addition. Uh, we do have a couple employee-led yoga sessions. Uh, we have a softball team. They do a lot of things during public service recognition week. We have a running club and then chicken night. Um, it's just something that the court started a long time ago and it's a once a year we have a, a minor league baseball team in Indianapolis. Um, and so the law clerks provide the, the chicken. Um, we have a meal there at the Supreme Court and then we go to the ball game. Um, and then we do offer a lot of lunch and learn sessions uh, led by employees about various topics. Just a few more pictures of some of those events that I mentioned. And then a couple other things that we've done. Uh, we have a monthly staff newsletter that's put together, lists out kind of activities that employees could go to. Um, and then, you know, we've done other things like active shooter training that you see up there. You know, that's not necessarily a fun topic, um, but it is important for people to feel safe and well. Uh, so we've offered that for our employees. We do have a statewide like health premium discount through our insurance company. And so there's a lot of activities on that. Go take this health quiz and you get 50 points, get 10,000 steps a day, you get points, all those add up to reaching a certain level and you get a discount on your health insurance. Um, and then just as far as you know, employee engagement and, and feeling included and well-being, we, we do promote all of our new employees so people can recognize who's coming on board. We do have a, a well-being hub on our employee intranet page where employees can go and kind of see what's happening, what's coming up, if they missed the monthly newsletter. So it's mentioning a few things that I've told you about. Calendar, um, different topics that we've done. We had a lunch and learn on ADA, um, active shooter. We have book club, as I've mentioned. And then last year we started something called Culture Club. So I know you're th singing the song right now, Karma Chameleon. Um, so it's made up of various leaders in our organization. I have them listed out here. Um, they meet or we meet once a month. I'm, I'm one of the members. And the, the thought was really just to get together and talk about what are you hearing from employees? Uh, is, what's HR hearing? What's uh, you know DEI hearing? Uh, what what's the boss hearing those type of things just so we can come collaborate talk about hey this employee or this group of employees have been mentioning this issue and we try to incorporate policies or activities um, to help us be a better overall employer because uh, honestly when it comes down to it you know we're competing we're government um, not necessarily the highest paid group of employees out there but little things like this I think make a big difference in helping employees feel like it's a great place to work um, I would also say I, I do love my job. I know that probably sounds weird, um, but I've worked jobs that I do not like. And um, I would encourage you for your well-being, like get out of that job. Like don't just be miserable for years and years. As I mentioned yesterday in the opening session, you know, length of service at a, at a company is becoming lower. I'm a little old school. So I was the one like, well, if they haven't worked somewhere five years, they're garbage. Um, that's not true. And uh, even my son who just graduated college, started a job and he wanted to leave there in six months because he hated it. And I told him, do it. Life's too short. Um, take care of yourself. Uh, so Culture Club in closing here, we do twice a year survey. Um, it's called Pulse. It's part of the state overall survey but we look at our individual Supreme Court uh, responses. So you can just get a quick glimpse here of what all employees can respond to if they want to. A lot of these questions are optional. You don't have to take the survey at all if you don't want to. Um, but just to get an idea of some of the demographics that people can uh, respond to and it helps us to understand our employee base, who they are, maybe some of the things they're struggling with or what we need to address. Um, the Chief Justice in Indiana, she always loves to compare 
our group with the rest of the state. So this gives us, we want to be better than the executive branch always. Uh, so this helps us kind of gauge where we are. Uh, SOI means state of Indiana. So you can see different scores, but these are, in my opinion, wellness type of aspects that we're surveying. You know, your, are your basic needs being met? Um, do you, you know, feel a sense of belonging? Do you have uh, a sense of being supported at work? Do you have the things you need? How's your professional development? All those types of elements we try to capture and it helps us to know we're not perfect. Uh, helps us to know the things that we're doing okay and things that we need to work on. And uh, at the very bottom, this is done in Tableau if you're familiar with that software. Uh, so it's a really nice tool that you can really drill down into the data and see where some of the issues are, but uh, really enjoyed seeing kind of the measure of employee engagement for our group versus the rest of the state. Um, always found it odd they ask about, I work with someone I consider a close friend. Uh, the court traditionally when I got there, they were very, very private. Uh, I came from Department of Transportation where they were very unprivate. Um, so at the court, it's kind of like people really didn't say like, hey, how was your weekend? What'd you do? Have you seen this movie? With time, I think you get there, but um, statistically they say it's really important to have like people at work that you consider a work friend. Um, so there's science behind that, but something we need to work on. And with that, I'll turn it back over to John. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you, Aaron. That was a great presentation. And um, I think that you could see how uh, you could use um, creativity to really address a very serious um, um, or a very important um, issue um, facing the courts, which is wellness. So I like the way um, how, you know, there's a lot of activities uh, to get employees engaged, but also a dashboard to, you know, kind of gauge the level of engagement. And one more thing that I would like to add to that is as you think about implementing any of these programs in your state is communication. Uh, communication is really important. Uh, <clears throat> we found um, uh, the prior state that I used to work at that not many people knew about the employee assistance program. And those who used it didn't think it was uh, beneficial, hence creating something that was more robust uh, to be able to respond uh, to the needs uh, of the employees. So thank you so much for that great presentation. And now I'll turn it over to Chila uh, to speak about the Massachusetts experience. Great. Thank you, Joan. Uh, let's see, I'll advance this. Uh, so as John mentioned when he was introducing me, um, I oversee all of our specialty courts, or recovery courts, mental health courts, and um, that is really where sort of the amount of trauma that court staff experience sort of hit me in the face um, because we had uh, a very experienced kind of long-term uh, probation officer in one of our veteran treatment courts and one of her participants said you know he was she had been working with him for an, you know one to two years um, he passed away the night that they were in court of a heart attack and it wasn't it wasn't a, a, an overdose those things you sometimes expect this was you know came completely out of the blue and she was really devastated and she could not return um, to the job, to what she was doing in the specialty court. She had to you know, take on some other probation responsibilities. And uh, that, I think, led, led us to uh, start talking um, with our other public health partners uh, in Massachusetts around what do you, you know, how they handle this. And our Department of Public Health actually uh, invited the trial court um, to utilize one of their resources, which uh, were to send in a trauma response when there was an overdose death or uh, or um, you know another tragedy and something. And their their response was to send in you know trained trauma clinicians to do an intervention or meeting with people to help them process what what had happened. So. Uh, but we know that you know what happens in specialty courts, you know, happens outside in the you know in the regular court system. So that really propelled us uh, to do uh, to do more, and we created this trauma response task force. Um, we had had we sent about seven of us to get trained in the uh, Gain Center curriculum, how being trauma informed improves. Uh, criminal justice outcomes, but we knew that if we that just doing training around that wasn't going to be sufficient. That we really needed uh, to take a much broader uh, approach to this. And what we learned in in our SAMHSA training was that 
when when you're talking about trauma and explaining to people you know what it is and how it impacts people they're getting in touch with their own personal trauma and you need to be prepared for that and that's we uh, we advised our chief justice that if if we go around and train everybody on what is trauma and what it feels like and how it impacts you and we don't have anything uh, sort of set up for the res for their response to that where this is not going to go well so um, so we put together uh, this uh, task force I will say it was one of the most um, popular uh, committees in the trial court I think we started off with about 35 members that were appointed um, by the uh, chief justice and court administrator our prior court administrator was the co-chair um, with me and uh, members of my team um, led the led the group through strategic planning so that we could really you know sharpen our focus on on the work that we needed to do here are our goals that we want people to understand recognize and effectively respond to trauma um, trauma affects trial court staff, court users, people in the, you know, in partnering agencies that we work with. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that the impact of trauma on jurors uh, is uh, prevented and mitigated. The, the group that we brought together, we tried to have every, we have seven trial court departments and um, Supreme Judicial Court, Appeals Court. Uh, we also brought in um, some people from, uh, from prosecutor's offices uh, and others who were interested in, and had expertise in this field. So um, this, we formed this committee in the fall of 2019. And you know what happened in the early spring of uh, 2020. So our work kind of shifted, um, but we were still able to accomplish uh, quite a bit. Um, I mentioned the SAMHSA training, uh, jury services. So um, one of the first accomplishments of the task force was for the trial court to establish a contract um, with an agency to provide trauma counseling or post jury service trauma counseling for people. And there's a brochure that every juror gets at the end of their service, and the, uh, and the brochure tells them how to access those services. And what we've seen was, um, we've seen you know, people taking advantage of it. We've seen a lot of, uh, an increase in inquiries. We're seeing a regular, like we've sort of hit, we think is more or less the level of utilization that we're probably going to get, and it's been very, very successful. We also did some other, uh, we did a Lawrence District Court um, trauma integration that's really bringing in a trauma specialist um, to help the trial court understand what we needed to do and change in order to be more trauma informed. Um, we also did employee onboarding modules on trauma, substance use disorder, and mental health. Um, and then we also you know, were, had these other resources, Mass for You, that's our employee assistance program. Uh, One Mind at Work is a, an effort of um, a lot of Fortune 500 companies, uh, and then also uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings. Um, the Lawrence District Court uh, Trauma Integration Project, we hired a, uh, an agency that does trauma response and trauma integration training in treatment programs in Massachusetts. And they adopted, they adapted their methodology um, for the court system and they did an assessment. We wanted them to really just pick, you know, ch we chose one location to sort of see what this was all about and to sort of pilot, pilot it. All of the staff in that court were trained multiple times on trauma and secondary trauma. Um, and at the uh, so after doing all of that, we were we they wanted to share what they had learned with uh, with others. And what we know about trauma is that uh, if somebody is, is triggered, that their um, their you know, the amygdala in the brain is what kicks in, and you basically all your brain is capable of doing is fight, flight, or freeze. And so we talked with the clinicians about what does that look like, and uh, and this committee really came up with uh, all of the uh, all of the proposed um, solutions. And then at the bottom, we made sure to include self care um, because we have tough jobs. I would say another sort of another area that we're working on too is um, the culture of of the trial court in Massachusetts. So. 
Um, when I first started about 10 years ago, I would say what I heard was there's no crying in the trial court. And that was really about, um, hand me my water. Um, that was really, you know, that we have a tough job to do. We, you know, you deliver sentences, you put people in custody. It's difficult. And, um, and, but we know that they, those, those things impact us as human beings. And if we're not allowing staff um, to express that, we're doing a disservice to them, to ourselves, and to the public. Thank you. Uh, let's see, here's our brochure uh, that we send out. And um, we have one person at that agency that's really fielding all of the calls and she gives the jury commissioner data on a monthly basis about utilization and uh, calls. And we've definitely seen um, a real increase in utilization. Not in over, you know, it's not every juror um, need, feels like they need these services. So we're comfortable with the level uh, that, are, that are using it. <coughs> Uh, this is our about our employee assistance program, and we were a little concerned in the trial court that this is you know the EAP for the entire state, all state employees. Um, when, but what we have heard uh, from employees who have used it is that they're they're very quick. They will you know get you can have I think three sessions uh, if you need some counseling, and then they'll connect you to um, a licensed clinician uh, that is covered by your insurance. And we've heard really really positive um, positive feedback about when people have accessed uh, these services. Uh, we also access those services when there's, if we have a major, uh, cri a major critical incident, like a, we've had shootings near the courthouse that involved, you know, court staff, um, you know, coming to the rescue and uh, things like that. So when when those things happen, um, we'll call in EAP. Uh, but we also recognize that there are a lot of things that happen in the courts that aren't that level, um, but that are still very, very, very upsetting. So if you have uh, a coworker pass away, we had somebody you know die in the in the office. Um, those things, uh, you know, we need to have a system that is sort of like hospitals and other big uh, institutions that we can respond to all levels of of crisis. So from you know, something happened in a local local court, there may be a smaller sort of crisis response. We have our court officers are being trained in uh, psychological first aid, mental health uh, first aid, so that they can be part of that, uh, that crisis response. And I would say these two initiatives, um, so we're now coming up on, uh, four and a half years into this, and I would say in the uh, back about nine months ago uh, we decided to really sharpen the focus of the of the um, task force to these two areas so uh, we knew that we needed to really work on these um, uh, really full time in order to make them happen. So we have half of the task force uh, working on crisis response, uh, and then half of them working on um, how we do and expand the training that we have available for people on uh, on trauma and self care. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff out there. Our probation department does has a training division that do a great job. The trial court training division does a great job, but they're kind of haphazard. It's, they're sort of one-off uh, trainings and we really need to make sure that people um, understand what trauma is how it impacts you and if our, our strategy has been that if our court staff um, understand what trauma feels like and they feel like we as their employer care about them and what they're experiencing on their job every day, um, then they will be better at understanding what court users who are coming into the court who, you know, we, we have to assume that all of them have experienced significant trauma in their lives, that they will have a better capacity uh, to be empathic with, uh, with court users as well, because we know uh, the impacts of, of trauma. And I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sheila. That was excellent. And um, of course, I don't waste an opportunity to talk about uh, the juror experience because I was in that position where I was um, summoned. I was picked to be a juror, even though I was 
working for the court system and they picked me and here I was listening testimony to testimony for four days nonstop about a se sexually danger dangerous person seeking to be released. So I was making a lot of observation of what was happening in the courtroom and it seems to me like everyone was ro robotic. Um, the court officer, um, she was very stoic, uh, the clerk, even the judge. And um, I'm starting thinking, you know, what is going on? You know, what are we putting these uh, the folks through, jurors and uh, court staff as well? <clears throat> and I, after we served, we deliberated, we finished the case, I asked the court officer, I said, you know, what was going through your head uh, when you were there for four days? And her answer was, all I see is hands going up. Um, my mind is so shut off because I need to protect my well-being, even though it affects me uh, if I let it sip in. But my uh, mechanism to you know dealing with that is to just I focus uh, uh, on the jury box, and if I see hands go up, that's when I pay attention. That is not a good way uh, to operate. That is not a good way to go about your day without having resources, hence uh, the creation of uh, you know, resources for jurors, um, which um, you know, it's been uh, very well received. And I think that, um, okay, so what do we have here? I'm going back for this. I'm not that good at that. So um, let's see here, because now I think I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen um, and the panel to talk about um, core users. What are we doing for core users? Thank you, John. And thank you, Sheila and Aaron as well. Um, it, it, you just mentioned this, John, but I think it's so essential that we think about our court users as well when we think about well-being and wellness in our court community. And so um, Sheila and John talked about the juror experience. We are seeing more and more courts think about the jurors that come before them and how they can support them throughout the, the full process from beginning to end, but then especially um, at the end, making sure that there's um, resources for them to help with what they've experienced in the courtroom um, and making sure that, that if they are experiencing secondary trauma, um, that they have resources um, for counseling and support services. So we are seeing more and more of that um, throughout the country, but I think Massachusetts is a great example of a court that has done some amazing work in that area. Um, we're also seeing more of a focus on trauma-informed courthouse design, and we have a courthouse uh, design team at the National Center, and so they partner with courts and help them um, to think about their space and how it impacts court users. And so there are eight different goals um, that they have told us are priorities when it comes to creating a trauma-informed space. And the first one is to provide breakout or wellness spaces. So making sure for court staff that you have that space um, that we've talked about earlier today. Also providing natural light and views. I think in the past it was often the C-suite that had all the nice views and the, the windows, and now we're seeing more courts change that philosophy in, in that space utilization where all staff have access to light, um, which we know is, is helpful for wellness and well-being. Selecting interior finishes carefully, so think about the paint that you use and think about the design and have a calm, um, natural, neutral space. Spaces should be well lit as well and developing an acoustically balanced environment, so thinking about noise. Um, develop an easy to understand wayfinding system and this is especially helpful for our court users, making sure it's clear and understandable and how they moved th mo move through the court facility and building. Provide a transparent and open interior environment and provide spaces for families and children. Um, I love the court facilities that have a reading room for children or a space for them to be comfortable when they come into the courthouse um, and help them so that it's not an anxiety producing experience for them. And the last one I want to mention is remote hearings. Remote hearings can certainly be helpful for our court users when it comes to their wellness and well-being. We know that it's challenging. We've talked about the impact of trauma. Um, Sheila's mentioned that and how that can be really difficult for court users when they come into the space. So think about leveraging remote hearings when you can. We know that um, you know it decreases cost for court users as well to not have transportation costs and childcare costs. And think about how you can meet their needs whenever possible. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, how about you? 
not much to add to what's already been okay. been mentioned by the others. Um, but certainly the the chief justice is very mindful of you know what it takes to take off work to come to court and those types of elements. So she's been very focused on making that as uh, as few barriers as possible for folks. Great, thank you. Sheila, anything else you would like to add? Um, sure. In Massachusetts, uh, you know, we've continued uh, to use remote hearings in a sort of a hybrid environment uh, because we've found that it improves access to justice for a lot of folks. It, re it eliminates those transportation issues, child care issues, you know, the amount of time that they lose from work uh, and all of that. So, um, yeah, so we're keeping the remote hearings where it's appropriate and, um, you know, and it seems to be working very well. Right, thank you. Uh, Kristen, can you walk us through what resources are available uh, for the core community? Yes, can you change the slide, please? Of course. Thank you. <laughs> Let me see if I'm gonna do it right. <laughs> All right, so we promised you resources and tools. And so we have several slides um, with different resources and tools, and we do have a link on the slide. And so you have the, these materials on your app too. So I wanna mention that. So if you wanna take a look at them, you should have them available to you. Thank you. So the first one is the Judicial Task Force, um, their final report on the state court's response to mental illness. So this is the a collaboration between um, CCJ, which is the Conference of Chief Justices, and COSCA, um, the Conference of State Court Administrators, a resource that they have put together um, to uh, in a response to mental illness. And, and they have a ton of different resources and tools available through that guide as well. They also have a bi-monthly listserv that you can sign up for. Um, and there are a ton of wonderful resources in that. So take a look at that. The next one is a pandemic um, resource that was put together a few years ago during the pandemic. We had the National Center in Costco and CCJ stood up a pandemic response team. And one of the resources that we provided was um, this resource addressing the mental health and well-being of judges and court employees. Again, a lot of tips and tools and best practices. Um, the states that I had mentioned earlier, uh, having a wellness committee and different initiatives are listed in there as well with links to their resources. So that might be of interest to you. Um, a lot of resources and research and podcasts and webinars as well. Um, so the next one is Executive Coaching Program, and this is a program that is um, dear to my heart at the National Center. We started this about a year ago with the intent to truly support our court staff and court community um, and court leaders by providing coaching for them. So at the National Center, we believe that every individual we work with is resourceful, creative, and whole, and it's our job to partner with them to unlock their potential. So it's a confidential process where we meet with coaches to work on whatever problem um, that they're experiencing in their work environment. So we provide one-on-one -on -one coaching. We provide productive pair coaching, working with judges and trial court administrators. We also provide group and team coaching where we can work with teams of individuals, um, leadership teams. And we also provide um, judicial and administrative coaching training programs where we can come to your court and train on how to be a coach, how to be a mentor um, for the staff that you work with. We also have a research initiative that is the Mindful Courts. So if you take a look at our website, um, we have, I think it's like 10 or 15 recorded um, mindful meditation sessions that are recorded for your, your use. Um, but it's a research project that was focused on mindfulness within the court system and the benefit of mindful, mindfulness meditation. And the last one, um, to make sure that you all have some resources you can share with your judges, um, this slide is focused on resources for the judiciary. Um, the first one is a Judicial Resilience Alliance. This is through the National Judicial College. They have a ton of resources available on that, on that site um, to help judges to work on their, their stress and resiliency. The next one is a wellness, um, judicial wellness resource from the National Center that we've created for judges. And the last I think is, um, is fairly new. It's a national helpline for judges helping judges. So it's judges that have um, struggled with substance abuse and mental health and have gone through treatment and um, are in recovery and they are volunteering their time to help judges. So it's a it's a wonderful resource and opportunity for them. Great, thank, thank you, thank you Kristen. And um, so I just wanna mention that all these resources are within the app. Uh, the full presentation is available there. Uh, would link to the resource. No, it's not. 
He should be. I will make sure he gets to the app because uh, he should have been there. Uh, but I think that the takeaway is that you don't have to start uh, from ground zero. Uh, there is a lot of resources uh, for you to start thinking about what kind of programs will work for your courts. Uh, or every single court system is different, so uh, you have you know to make it specific to uh, your jurisdiction. Uh, but there are resources available. Um, Chile, Aaron and many other states uh, that are doing this uh, kind of work. Um, I wanna go back to where I started with taking the temperature. Um, those who were five, how many moved to 10? <laughs> That's okay. So we try, um, but um, so one thing that we wanna end with is we want you to write down two things you would like to uh, do once you go back uh, to your courts, both to assist, um, no, go right ahead, uh, both to assist the, um, um, the employees as well as the core users. So think about that. I'm gonna give you one minute to write two things down because I'm gonna ask for you to please share, if you don't mind, uh, what those strategies uh, could potentially look like. John, to help you, uh We've got some comments from the chat, um, just some ideas that they've shared in addition to the folks from the presenters. So one person shared that they've uh, worked through their insurance provider, um, signed up for a weight loss and stress management program, got a nutritional coach. Um, they have a stretching program. Um, their HR department sends out a monthly health quiz that's uh, intended to sort of educate folks on health and nutrition. So just wanted to share some other ideas in addition to what the presenters and you shared. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Thank you. So anyone else from the audience would like to share one, two strategies uh, you will put in place in your courts? It's early, but. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I don't put on. Yep. I can just go. I don't put. I'll turn it on for you. Thank you. At Alcoda, our HR department does have a wellness program that they do um, make sure and promote on a weekly and monthly basis. They have a SharePoint page where it's fully developed with a bunch of resources. Myself as a manager, I think that um, incorporating that in our monthly or biweekly meetings to, co to continue to enhance the awareness of the, that portal so um, our employees do have um, access and know of it so they can use it if they're in times of need. Great, uh, so you touch on two good points here, which is awareness and communication. Something that I mentioned earlier, uh, you could create all these resources, but if you don't communicate them out uh, to the core community, they're just gonna sit there um, idle. Anyone else would like to share? I know it's a little warm in here. Um, so we'd like to point that out. Um, but I would like to hear from at least two more. One more. Back right here. So to add on, I'm from the same court, but I've, I'm a new employee there. And I can tell you this campaign has been really meaningful to me as a new employee. It's called Time For You. So it's got really great marketing and it uh, has really great content, including um, the court is using the internal family court services resources that are specially trained mediators to provide custom content for uh, promoting these campaigns throughout the court. So it's really rich materials, including one that was called recreational self-care that was talking about not just taking care of yourself by getting out and you know exercise or walking but also just doing the things you love and so they're using internal resources to help promote and support this uh, kind of time for you campaign so it's really good wonderful wonderful one more okay we have someone back there I just wanted to give a shout out to to our furry friends trained comfort animals definitely uh, it's not something that I ever would have thought would be in, in a courthouse, but our court recently uh, um, adopted that, whatever you want to call it. I, I, I think it, uh, it was great and uh, really helped a lot for a particular incident that, that occurred recently that, that really impacted certain employees. So 
definitely good thought to consider if you haven't done that yet. Great, thank you. So uh, before we wrap up, any questions, any burning questions from the audience you would like to ask? There you go. Tell us about the snakes again, please. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm just curious because I, I, we, we didn't really touch on it, but I was wondering if anyone could speak to um, ERGs as a wellness tool. <laughs> ERGs. Um, I, you know, I don't think that in Massachusetts that we've done, um, done that yet. I think that one of the things that we know that we need to do around, um, changing the culture is, uh, training for managers. So, um, because it's, it takes a lot of, it, there are a lot of soft skills, um, that people need to develop in order to have those difficult conversations with employees when you see that they're stressed and not you know, not responding in the ways that you would like to see them respond. So, um, yeah, so that I think management training, but I haven't, uh, I've done it in, in my past life before the trial court, but not, I haven't seen it here. Uh, but it's certainly something I think that we could. St for everybody but you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Massachusetts. <laughs> Insider info. Uh, so in Indiana, we don't have formal groups yet, but the survey that I briefly showed you on screen was just happened in the fall. Um, and so based on that, we are going to try to create more, what I would say, formal groups where people know when they are, what types of groups, how you can get connected to those. Because that's the first time we really have done an employee survey that allowed employees to identify different things about them demographically, um, more so than in the past. So that's really the first time we got the data. Um, and and I, I will say we've pushed really hard on you know, people being their authentic self and bringing that person to work and not, you know, secretive or, hey, that's none of my business. Like if they, I mean, they're not forced to respond to the survey, certainly if they don't want to, but it has helped us realize, hey, there's this demographic that we really need to consider and do something for. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is what a great idea to collect some data around some ERGs throughout the nation. And we can certainly try to see if we can do that and collect some information so we can provide it out on the ERGs that do exist in some states and some resources in creating them as well. So thank you for raising that question. And now you've got me thinking about some things we could do to hopefully help support you. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question, another question here. This question is particularly for Aaron. I was wondering if you can give us an example or some examples of um, what came out of Culture Club and maybe what changes you've implemented. Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, a couple policies. So we've talked a lot about things that are fun, voluntary, that a lot of times have been employee driven. But a couple policy level items have been two that I can think of. One is we now have a limit on how much vacation or personal time you can carry over year to year. So kind of that whole burnt out sense. Um, and so the Culture Club talked about that element and Chief Justice approved where you can no longer carry over more than 150 hours of vacation from year to year, calendar year. Um, when I came from the Department of Transportation, literally had some 20, 25 year employees that worked in my shop and had you know, 2,000 and some hours of vacation built up over the years. Um, and so the group, the Chief Justice agreed, like we want you to take time off. Now, technically they don't lose it. If you're over 150, it, it rolls into your sick leave bank. Um, but in a general sense, from the top down, the chief has promoted, hey, you need to take time off. Managers, let your people take time off. We don't want you carrying over all these hours and never unplugging, as the gentleman mentioned. Um, and then the other one that's a recent addition has been allowing the traditional sick time bucket at work to now be used for mental health. Uh, that's been a challenge. Uh, certainly, how do you really police that, monitor that, make sure folks aren't fibbing about it. Um, but we came to the conclusion in Culture Club and then again, ultimately the, the Chief Justice, people are going to lie about sick time too, right? 
Um, and so why not do something that hopefully allows them to get a mental break? And, and the goal is to proactively prevent them from physically getting sick. So sick days in the traditional sense is, hey, I am ill. I have a fever, a flu, a cough. Now we're saying, hey, if you are burnt out at your max, you need a break. You're allowed to use those sick leave hours to prevent yourself from physically getting sick. So it's really more about kind of the whole person well-being aspect and and that's fairly new so we're you know trying to watch for abuse and those type of things but generally it's just a way to say hey i'm i'm spent i'm gonna take tomorrow off play pickleball um (laughs) go do something that i enjoy that kind of recharges rejuvenates me because we feel that makes you a more productive employee at the end of the day and thus makes the court better great thank you uh one more question here um uh the question uh, have you ever considered or do you allow any paid time for these well-being programs or these employee programs or is it all voluntary on lunch hours or after work That's for you, Eric. So the question is whether we allowed paid time for those activities. I'll choose my words wisely here, uh, <laughs> since I do oversee HR as well. Um, <laughs> generally, yeah, like from a high level, the chief justice, chief administrative officer, very uh, encouraging about those activities. Now, like the the playing board games at lunch, that is really on your lunch break type of thing. Um, the lunch walk is during your lunch break. So technically that's not like paid time during those moments, but certainly we have, again, the state's like health insurance discount thing where you can take a quiz or do a lunch and learn and they have authorized that to be work time in those sense. So it, it varies um, would be my official answer to that depending on what it is and how it fits in with with the court's culture um so but definitely more so than i would have thought you know five years ago that again kind of what i grew up in work wise it would have been like no we are not paying folks to spend time you know doing a health quiz at work but now they've they've really promoted like hey this is for their well-being we're gonna let your employees take this so like the survey i mean that took time that was work time uh we didn't say hey you got to do this after hours it's like this is important to us we want you to take time fill it out um so it varies anyone else great thank you and one question in the back so paternity leave is really taking a big um state at least in our area for the attorneys that work around us is that trickling down into the courts into the personnel in the courts and what if anything are you doing to address the desire of what I would call the younger generation that we were talking about yesterday to want to exercise paternity leave. So open to anyone who wants it but me. Yeah, in Indiana, we do have <laughs> new parent leave. That's for a father or a mother. Um, I'm trying to remember how many hours. Uh, I think it's. I think it's four weeks, if I recall correctly. That's paid time off for again the either parent during new parent leave. I can add, um, I've been with the National Center for about two years, but before that I was with the Minnesota Judiciary, as John had shared, and we added paternity leave um, sometime three, four years ago or something like that. So we are seeing, you know, courts kind of shifting to allowing that as well. Great. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention this morning, and please help me uh, thank the panel who provided all this wonderful information. Thanks, everyone.